good to see you this morning. And uh, as you take your seats, please do take out your message outline as we begin this uh, new series of messages. We're going to be in this for the next uh, five weeks. It's a new series of messages that I've called Real Life. And uh, you'll see there that I put on the, uh, on the screen there, you'll see it's real life. And then our tagline, really, if you like, is what it says underneath there, when the good life is not good enough. That's what we're going to be talking about over these next five weeks. We're going to look at what real life is. What is the better life? Uh, what is that better life is the question, I guess. Now, in our society, in, in the areas certainly we live in, but certainly in the UK, in the society in which we live, we know a lot about the good life. You're probably living the good life in many ways. I mean, you've most likely got a fairly good home and a uh, good family, a good job. Um, you're probably in fairly good health. Uh, you would say, if uh, we sat down and chatted, that you're living a, a good life. There might be moments in it where it's not so good, but as you sort of take a sweep over your life, you would probably say that actually I've got it fairly good. I'm, it's pretty good. I mean, the reality is compared to many people in the rest of the world, uh, you've got it good. We live at a good standard of living in many ways. We are living the good life. And if you're like most people in this area, you probably feel fairly satisfied with your life. Pretty good, thanks very much, it's all good. Uh, going on quite nicely, things are as they should be. I feel quite satisfied, you're, you're living the good life. But what if there was something more? What if beyond the good life there was a better life? What if you were missing out on something you didn't even know about? What if God intended more for just the good life for you, but he intended for you the better life? Wouldn't you want to know about that? I would hope that you would. See, we often settle for less because we don't know that there's anything better. So, for example, when I, when I was a baby, uh, my parents had fed me uh, something like Heinz strained spinach. <laughs> it was yummy. Because I didn't know any better, did I? For me, I thought that was fantastic. Now, of course, today I think it tastes like cat sick or something like that. Not that I've had any recently. The spinach, not cat sick, I should hasten to add. May, actually, maybe that's what, uh, that's what the kids will feed me, uh, you know, that strange spinach when I'm old, you know, that sort of stuff. It's probably the only thing I'll be able to eat at that point. But, um, and I think parents that feed kids that sort of stuff, you should be tortured, really. But anyway, the point is, the point is, I didn't know any better, did I, than strange spinach at that point. Now, when I went to primary school, then I learned about alphabet spaghetti. Well, now, that's a definite step up, wasn't it, from strange spinach uh, and when I became a teenager, well, I learned about McDonald's. Can you still remember your first McDonald's? All right, I'm a bit sad. But anyway, you know, now we're talking, aren't we? I mean, we've gone right up. And, you know, definitely there are things be better in life. And, of course, today I've tasted lots of great food and enjoyed that and all those sorts of things. But I would never go back to strained spinach. Why? Because I've tasted something better. Uh, I, and I believe that God has brought us here today to tell us, to explain to us that actually there is something far better than what we perhaps are living with. There is something that is much better than looking good, feeling good, having the good. Uh, that's okay, the good life is fine, there's lots of good things about that. But actually there is a better life. Now I've discovered that underneath this image of this, this good life that the world wants us to have, wants us to, to buy into, that there are these, these little dirty little secrets that are behind the scenes that nobody wants to talk about, but actually are there. Number one, people feel exhausted in the so-called good life. They just feel worn out. They say things like, you know what, I'm just tired all the time. I can't keep up with the pace. I just feel overloaded by life. When I get home in the evening, I'm so tired from all the things that I've done, well, I just crash. I am worn out. I, I fall asleep in front of the television. I don't have any energy to do anything else. A and maybe, actually, if you're working really hard, then you feel there's other work that you've got to do, and you just feel so exhausted all the time. Aiming for this good life, there is this sense of exhaustion. And then exhaustion always leads to the second thing, which is emptiness. You say, do you know what, I don't think I could cope with another thing. I don't think I've got another thing in me. I couldn't sign up for another thing. I couldn't be committed to another thing. I literally feel that I'm stretched to the limit. And I feel empty inside. 
And maybe in those quiet moments you're thinking, do you know what, if this is the good life, if this is the good life that actually everybody wants me to buy into, how come I feel so unsatisfied in life? Why don't I feel more meaning in my life? And by the way, what is true meaning to life? What is the meaning of all this stuff? Getting and having more and accomplishing more and trying to just get things that are as good as they can be. What's the meaning behind all this stuff? If it's so good, why don't I feel satisfied? And then emptiness leads to enslavement, where people start to say, do you know what, I feel trapped. I feel trapped by maybe the, the debt that I find myself in because I've overextended myself. I've bought a too big a house. I've got too many things, and now I'm having to pay that off. I feel trapped in a relationship, whatever that might be, whatever the relationship could be, and you feel trapped by that. I can't get on with it, but I can't get out of it, so I feel trapped by that. Or maybe I feel trapped by the expectations of what people think about me. I always feel I have to be something in front of certain people, or people want me to be some way, or I think that's what they want me to be, and I feel trapped by that. Or I feel trapped by guilt. There are things in my past that I still haven't dealt with, and I always feel that sense of guiltiness, or I feel trapped by fear. I'm fearful of things perhaps going wrong. I'm fearful of things not as they should be. I live with that sense of anxiety. Or I feel trapped by my own anger. Or I feel trapped by a bitterness that I feel towards somebody who has hurt me, maybe quite devastatingly, but I feel that bitterness and I can't get over that. And I feel empty and enslaved. I feel a slave to just my schedule of life, that I'm always busy. There's never a sense of being able to stop and to press the pause button or to just experience true life in the way I want it to. I just feel I'm always, always on and on the go. You ever feel like any of those? The emptiness, the exhaustion, the, the enslavement, the feeling trapped by things that are in our life? That's the good life that the world wants you to believe, that many people sell their soul for today. See, the reality is, is that there is an antidote to this, and it is called the better life. And the reason I think God brought us here this morning for us to look at this is so that we might understand what that is. What is real life? When the good life is not good enough, what is real life? What is the life that we should be living? What is this better life that a life with Jesus Christ, a life with him, what is the better life that Jesus Christ offers us? And I want to suggest to you three things this morning. There were many that I could put down, but here are the three main things that I think speak to the, the modern condition that many of us face today, many people living around us face today, maybe even ourselves personally we experience. Here is the better life Christ offers. What are they? Three things. First of all, follow on your outline. First of all, a life with Christ, it is a life filled with meaning. It is a life filled with meaning. The fact is that every one of us is looking for some type of meaning in our lives. Now, the problem is, is that most people look, look everywhere and anywhere except from God, apart from God. They look to try and find the answer. So it was Plato, the Greek philosopher, who described man as a being in search of meaning. And so for some, it is a conscious quest that just dominates their life. They're always searching to find meaning. They want to find themselves. Many of us prefer, prefer to suppress it or to just laugh it off because deep down we fear that it might lead nowhere. That in the words of Edmund Blackadder, life is like a broken pencil, pointless. And we are surrounded by people who suffer from what is called the Marie Antoinette disease because she first coined the phrase that sums it up so well. She said, nothing tastes. Everything seems to just be so bland and meaningless. People everywhere are crying out inwardly, there must be something more than this, something that will give meaning and purpose to life. They look all over for satisfaction. They look for water that will quench this spiritual thirst that they have find in their life. They may bury it with lots of different sorts of things, but there is this spiritual thirst, this spiritual hunger for something. Now some look to money and possessions. Their whole lives are dominated by this desire to just accumulate more and more stuff, to have more possessions, 
bigger houses, better cars, more things, whatever it might be. We live in a very materialistic society. I read re this uh, only recently that uh, there was some research done that there, there are nearly 750,000 people living in this country who are addicted to shopping. I don't know how they found that out. I don't know who owns up to that sort of stuff. There's probably more than that, but that is the reality. Uh, it was by some uh, report by the, the Economic and Social Research Council. And in this report, they interviewed many people. And one, uh, a couple of people they interviewed, one person said, uh, they, he said, the only way to stop being depressed is to go shopping. <laughs> but then it comes back again. Another added, it's like time stands still when I am shopping. Now, if you're a husband of your wife, you often feel like that while you're waiting for her to, you know, finish her shopping. But anyway, isn't that sad? That's how people see it. And we know people say these things. If only I could win the lottery and then I could afford a bigger house. Or maybe a faster car or, or more exotic holidays. Then, well, everything would be great. All would be well. But would it? There's a famous quote, but you may have heard it before, by a guy called John D. Rockefeller. He was one of the richest men in the 20th century. And he was once asked, how much money does it take for someone to be really satisfied? He replied, just a little bit more. Now, most of us know the truth of that. We have seen enough miserable millionaires to know that money and possessions are not the key to fulfilling life. But here's my question. Why is it then that we still pursue them? Now, we may not have the idea that we want to be a millionaire one day, but we still, at certain levels, pursue material possessions because we think that might bring fulfillment when we have the latest thing. Why is that? Now, others perhaps don't look necessarily for material possessions. Others look to sex and relationships to satisfy their thirst within. Now, of course, great, uh, uh, th these things can pro provide great pleasure, and they are great things in the right context, with sex within marriage, as ordained and uh, designed by God, uh, in a marriage relationship. And yet, so many people are confused by these things, and they explain it away because they feel that they get their meaning and their purpose and a sense of pleasure through these things. And what it does is it increases this insecurity in people's lives. See, the old morality has been rejected with this sense of anything goes. It doesn't matter what happens as long as I don't hurt anybody. So let me show you. George Michael, who is a very hedonistic person, whatever you think about him, he summed up the current mood in an interview with The Big Issue a little while ago, and he, write, he said this. He said, the only moral involved in sex is whether it is consenting or not. That is our moral standard for today. That is what is taught in schools for today. It doesn't say that you should abstain and not have sex until you're married, it says, as long as it's consenting, anything goes. Now, you see, without the guidelines of the past, young people don't know where to turn in the areas of this area of their life. In fact, so many people don't know where to go. Here's one first-year student. She described her experiences in a university flat. She says this, there are five of us, all girls, one regularly has casual sex with guys she picks up at nightclubs. One is a practicing lesbian, and one has a boyfriend who stays here virtually all the time. In the first term, one of us had an abortion. Two took the morning after pill. I just don't know how to cope with all of this. And by the way, we should be praying for our young people who are students at university because it's an opportunity for them to really grow and serve God if they get plugged into the right Christian union in the right church. But it's also a time where they can really blow up their faith if they're not careful. This is the world that we live in, you see. And even if anything starts well, we do not seem to make our relationships last. We, we live in this sort of throwaway culture, and so when the toaster stops working or we don't like it, and there is a better, newer model out there, we just throw the old one away and get a new model. And we can do that, do the same thing with lovers, which leave many people feeling as if they are on the scrap heap, and they feel more empty than they felt before. Now, there are still others who look, for, look to ambition and success as a way of 
to finding meaning to their life. That's what they live for. So they have their sight set on some goal that they long to achieve, maybe a first-class degree, maybe a place in the team or, or promotion at work. It's all about what they can achieve. But so often, when the goal is achieved, when they've arrived to the destination that they've set in their minds, uh, the, and the initial euphoria passes, it, it just leaves us just the same as they were before. I've done that, now what? Pleasure is just as fleeting as well. And yet still the pursuit of pleasure is the driving force in many people's lives. We live in a hedonistic, pleasure-seeking society today where we want to experience anything and everything because it's all about me and what I want and just enjoy my life. Live it to the full, to the max. Live it at 100 miles an hour because I want to experience all the pleasure I can. Jackie Collins, the novelist, if I can flatter her with that title, summed up her aim in life, which is quite ironic because she obviously, as you know, she's passed away now, but she summed up the aim in life with these words. She wrote, you can be 14 or 45, but you'll never know when your life is going to end, so you really must enjoy every day, every minute. Live life, that's my motto. Jeff Goldblum, the actor, lives his life to a similar philosophy. He wrote, live and love is how I organise my life. In fact, it is not only a part of my teaching and acting, but my chief endeavour. Get the commonplace out of the way, put on your clothes and have fun. We live in a society that worships pleasure, but so often those who worship pleasure end up disillusioned. It fails to deliver what it promises, because what was at first an intoxicating experience soon appears to be dull, and then it needs to be replaced by an even greater experience, an even greater high. Life just becomes this, this tantalizing search for the ultimate experience, the ultimate pleasure, which is just always beyond our reach. That's the society which we live in today. People are searching for meaning, they are confused, do not have any sense of purpose because they have this spiritual hunger, this spiritual thirst inside of them. You see, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, it's to go through your entire life without knowing your purpose, without knowing why you are here, a life without meaning. Now, ultimately, most people go through life never knowing their purpose, never knowing why God put them here on earth. And I'll be blunt with you this morning, the good life is not good enough. So many people, would, when you talk to them about Christ and you share Jesus with them, they think, why on earth do I need him? I've got it pretty good, thanks very much. You may even think that yourself. I don't need Jesus. My life is quite happy, quite good. Why do I need Jesus? this sense of looking good, feeling good, having the good, and yet that's not enough for full fulfilment, to be happy. See, if that was true, then Hollywood would be the most happy place in the world. To be a celebrity, to have every fame and fortune, would be the most happiest thing. Well, we know that's not true. It takes more than money, it takes more than celebrity and fame and so forth, it means it takes meaning to have a life of significance. Now, a lot of people confuse a full life with a meaningful life, and they are not the same. See, having a full schedule is not the same as having a fulfilled life. You can be still so busy, such a full life, and yet still have a sense of emptiness. You have no meaning. And we search for meaning in all kinds of different ways. We think if we get more possessions, then that will add to meaning in my life. But there's always more to get. There's always the latest thing we go after that, or if I accomplish certain things in my life, well, then that will have meaning. But there is always more to do, more to accomplish. So we search for meaning through maybe hobbies or sports, or we travel, or through relationships, through sex, through food. They're all good things in their right place, in the way the Bible wants it to be, the way that God ordained it to be. There's nothing wrong with those things. It's just they don't last. And when the experience is over, where do you get the, your meaning in life? In those down times, in those moments when you put your head on your pillow at night, totally exhausted from the life that you're leading, and you suddenly think, why do I feel so empty? Well, it's because you need something that gives you constant meaning, eternity.
channel meaning. Now, where do you get that? Well, there's only one place. From the God who created you. Colossians 3 verse 4 says, Christ gives meaning to your life. You were made by God for God. So you didn't make yourself, you didn't create yourself, God made you. So if God didn't want to make you, you wouldn't even be alive. He made you, therefore, for a reason. He made you for a purpose. And until you understand that you are made by God and for God, life will not ever make sense. And until you understand the purpose, the reason that he put you here on earth for, you can't step from the good life to the better life. The, the, the passage that was read earlier on in 1 Peter chapter 1 is just a great passage. That's why we read it all the way through because it's a wonderful description of what a life in Jesus is, a life as a Christian is, a life in Christ, and what it means to live for Jesus, the responsibilities and the privileges. Let me read verses uh, 3 and 4 to you in the, in the message paraphrase because it puts a slightly different light on it, which I think is helpful. It says this, because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life. We have everything to live for, including a future in heaven, and that future starts now. So often we think that when we become a Christian, eternal life begins when we die. No, eternal life begins as soon as you come to Christ. It is the life with Jesus and for Jesus. Now let me show you a couple of things from this verse. Notice that this better life is connected to what Jesus did at Easter through his death and his resurrection. His coming back to life enables me to live a better life. Better than just the good life. And notice the other thing here is that the better life is not just an addition to your old life. It's not something you just tack on. You cannot invite Jesus Christ into your life just as an add-on, just to make your good life slightly better. You do not add someone that big into your life without him making a difference. It's a whole new deal. It's brand new. God wants to give you a brand new life. Have you noticed? Have you noticed, and I'm a sucker for this, have you noticed how many products say new and improved? You know, that sort of thing. Now, I'm a sucker for that. I really am. Thinking, oh, yes, yeah, Sarah, let's get that new and improved, you know. Never used it before, but it says new and improved. Um, let's get that. But what does it mean? Well, what it means is same old junk with a new title. That's basically what it is, isn't it? I mean, it's just, I mean, there's little new stuff in this world, isn't there? It's just repackaged, relabeled, retitled. But God says, I want to give you a brand new life. I want to give you an opportunity to start over. I want to give you a chance to begin again. And that, you see, is the starting point of a better life. God will give you a brand new life. Now, I know that we have a number of golfers here at church. People who play golf. I used to play a few years ago, a couple of times a year. I don't play much now. I haven't got the time to play. I suppose I would like to. Um, but I'm not very good at it because I don't play that much. But there is something that I've learned about golf which is incredible. It's called a mulligan. Now, if you're a golfer, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't, let me educate you this morning what a mulligan is. Okay, here's what a mulligan. It's this. It's if, if you're taking your first shot, you're teeing off at the first tee, you're taking your first shot, and it's such a stinking shot. I mean, it hits the tree and it bounces off your partner's head. You know, a, a mulligan is this. A mulligan is when they give you a second shot. And this shot is free, and they don't count the first one against you. That's what a mulligan is. Well, let me put it this way. Jesus Christ wants to give you a mulligan for your life. He says, you know, all those stupid things that you've done in the past, all those things that you regret, all those things that you would have done differently, stupid decisions, bad mistakes, those sins, those faults and failures, whatever you want to call them, let's just erase all that stuff and let's just start over. Let's begin a brand new life. Let's step up from the good life as good as it may be, to the better life. And we'll wipe out all that old stuff, all those past things, and we'll wipe it all out and we will just begin again. No more guilt, no more guilty conscience, wiped out, begin again, start afresh, start over. And you say, well, that sounds pretty good. How do I get something like that? Well, you don't earn it, the Bible says. You, don't, you can't work for the better life. In fact, that verse says there, it says we've been given a brand new life. Notice it's been given to us. So therefore, it is a gift. You don't earn it. Let me summarize the whole Bible for you. 
You are made by God to have a relationship with him. It is a personal relationship with God. Not to just know about God, but to know him personally. God knows and he loves you and he wants you to know him and to love him back. Now, I'm not talking about religion. God couldn't care less about religion. That's not what I'm talking about. No, God is more interested in a relationship with you. You are made to have a relationship with God. That's why you are created. And yet there is one problem. God is perfect and you're not, and neither am I. So there is this big gap, this chasm between me and between God, and obviously I can't overcome that gap. And God says, well, I'll sort that out. I will come to earth. And he did that over 2,000 years ago in the form of a person named Jesus Christ. And he said, I will die for all the sins of the world. I will pay for everything that has been done wrong, so you don't need to pay for it. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. We have all sinned, so therefore we all deserve death. And Jesus says, I have come to take the penalty, to take the payment, to take the punishment for your sin, so that you don't have to pay for it. I will give you complete freedom in me. In other words, I will give you a mulligan on your life. And I'll let you start the game. I will give you a brand new life. Not only does he say that, he says, and therefore, then you'll have everything to live for. You will live a life of meaning. Now, the world won't tell you that, because the world doesn't want you to know that. Our society wants you to live for yourself, to get everything that you want, that will then give you meaning. But here's the truth, and it is this. You will never, ever be happy living for yourself. Because you weren't made for that. You weren't created by God for that. You were not made to live for yourself. In fact, I could give you hundreds of examples to show you show you that the more selfish you are, the more self-centered that you are, the more miserable you are. You're not made to live for you. You're made to live for God. And when you start living for God, that's when you discover real happiness and real meaning and real significance and real purpose, real value to your life. Because you're no longer living for, 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 for a little petty you. You're living for God. And the beginning of real life begins when you stop living for you and you start living for God. And you start, therefore, enjoying a life with Christ because you're living and serving him. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15. He says, he died, Jesus, so we would no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died and was raised to life for us. God says, you weren't made to live for you. You are made to live for me. When you live for God, you are plugged into God. That gives your life meaning. It gives your life significance. That gives your life purpose. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter whether you became a Christian late in life. You can start living for God as soon as you come to Christ. And then you find meaning and significance. I mean, I could sit down with some of you this morning and I could say, tell me about your life became a Christian, before you became a Christian, and now your life now. And you would say to me, I'm sure, quite clearly, that I have a life of meaning and significance post-conversion. Before I became a Christian, life was pretty good. But life with Christ is so much better. I could probably bring many of you up here to share that testimony quite easily. Because you know the reality of living with Jesus and for Jesus gives your life significance. And Jesus gave up everything so that you could have everything. He died so that you might live forever. He said, when you plug into me, I'll teach you meaning and purpose and a real life to live for. So that's the first thing. Real life is not just a life, is a life filled with meaning, but it's not just a life filled with meaning. Secondly, it is a life freed by grace. By grace. Now, what does that mean? Because grace is a good Bible term. Well, look at Romans 7, verse 6. It says this, we're free to live a new life in the freedom of God. Well, how does that happen? Well, it comes by grace. We are free to live a new life, freedom of God, but it comes by grace. Now, what is grace? Well, let me give you a definition. Grace is when God gives you what you need, not what you deserve. That is grace. You and I, as I said, we deserve death. We deserve, because the wages of sin is death, we deserve that. No, no, God gives us not what's 
gives you what you need, not what you deserve. That is grace. Everything you have in your life is because of God's grace. The next breath you take is a gift of God's grace. You do not deserve your next breath. If God didn't want you to take it, your heart would have stopped a long time ago. Your, the, the, your whole life you owe to the grace of God. And so often, we just live our lives with no gratefulness to God. We almost live our lives as if we don't even, he figures. I mean, we, we should almost get up every morning and say, thank you, Lord, for another new day for me to live and serve you. The whole of life we owe to the grace of God. You have nothing if God hadn't decided to make you. So grace, grace is saying, I love you, I forgive you, even though you can't earn it, God says. Grace is possible because Jesus Christ has taken your sin on the cross. Grace is God saying, I'm going to give you a second chance. Grace is the road to freedom. Now, what does Jesus set us free from? Well, there's lots of stuff. First of all, he sets you free from guilt. Well, that's a big one, isn't it? All the things you feel guilty about, he wipes them all out. He gives you that mulligan. He sets you free from the fear of death. See, as a Christian, I'm not afraid to die. Now, I might be a little bit concerned about how it happens, the process as such, but actually, I'm not afraid to die. And if you are a Christian, then you too shouldn't be afraid to die. Why? Well, because death is simply going home to be with the Lord. Because if I know Christ personally, and I have a relationship with him, then therefore I know where I'm going. Why? Well, because he's prepared a place for me in advance. So I do not have to fear when I pass from this world to the next. Because I know where I'm going. Grace also sets me free from the hurts that other people have caused me. And there are many people in life that hurt us. And the problem is, is that then we hold on to that and bitterness grows in our heart and we can't let go of it. We keep holding on to it. And that then can build anger and resentment and all sorts of things. And grace, Christ says, I will help you let that go. He sets you free from that. He can set you free from the expectations of other people because we know we are loved by God because his grace shows us that and yet so many of us live trying to please other people. We worry about what other people think about us. We try to live with those expectations and grace sets us free from that. He sets you free to be yourself that you no longer are a carbon copy of someone you think you should be, or you're one person with that group of people and another person with that sort of person, or you wear this mask and you fake it, whatever it might be. No, you be, can be the real you. Because grace tells you that you're loved by God for who you really are. He sets you free to grow and develop and become all God meant for you to be. He sets you free from worry, from anxiety. Some of us, many of us, perhaps worry about what is going to happen later today, tomorrow, next week. We worry about some things in our lives and we can be set free from that because we know that God is in control, therefore we do not need to worry. He sets you free from fear, maybe from boredom, from the meaningless of, not, less of life. He sets you free from, stop trying to earn God's approval. And that's a big one when it comes to grace. See, some people wonder if God likes them. Uh, you may be unsure about that if you don't understand grace. Every religion in the world, let me tell you this, every religion outside of Christianity, and I'm going to argue that Christianity is a relationship, as I said, not a religion, but every other religion is summarized in one of two words. It's either do or don't. All the other religions in the world basically say this, here's what you must do to get God to love you, to like you. And they all have their different lists. So one religion says you've got to do this. Another religion says you've got to do that. Another religion will say you've got to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and then they mix it all together, and, and you just don't know where you're going. And who's to say that what you do is, is enough? And if you do all these things, well, then God will smile on you and says, hey, that's okay, welcome, come into my heaven. But Jesus came to earth to say, that's all wrong. That's not it, I'm not into religion. I want you to have a relationship with me, and I've already done it all for you. You don't have to do anything. You just have to accept what already has been done for you on the cross. That's called grace. That's the biggest difference. Now, there are two paths you can choose in life. One is to spend the rest of your life trying to earn God's approval by your own efforts, doing certain things. The other is to enjoy God's approval by accepting what Jesus Christ has already done for you. 
you accept his gift of grace. Now, the first way doesn't work. It never has worked. It never will work. God says it doesn't work. The Bible says it doesn't work. You can't earn God's approval by things you do. So Hebrews 7, 18 and 19 says this. Yes, the old system of priesthood based on family lines, that is the old system of trying to earn God's approval by what you do, was cancelled because it didn't work. It was weak and useless for saving people. It never made anyone really right with God. But now we have a far better hope for Christ makes us acceptable to God. God cancelled the idea of you trying to earn your own way into heaven because it doesn't work. Heaven is perfect, and as I've already pointed out, you're not, neither am I. There's no way you're ever going to earn your way into heaven. So you may as well forget that one. It doesn't work. God cancelled that plan ages ago. He said there's only one way to get into heaven. There's only one way to get the better life. That is to accept my grace, my gift, my love, and what Jesus Christ has already done for you. Now, remember, this is a grace, it is a free gift, but it's not cheap because it costs Christ his life. It's a very expensive gift. He paid for your freedom. 1 Timothy 2, verse 6 says, he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. And so on the cross, Jesus bought your freedom by his death, by taking on your punishment. He paid to set you free. Now, there's a word to describe that. It's a word that we don't use much anymore, but it's the word called redemption. Now, let me explain this to you, because to be redeemed means to have your freedom paid for. Now, the reason we don't use this word so much today is because, really, it, it came about out of the slave trading years, so in the slave trading years, what would happen is that would, there would be people would intentionally buy slaves to, in order to set them free. And those people that did that, they were called redeemers. They would redeem a slave. So they would buy this person's freedom and then they would set them free. They would let them go. They were redeemed. Well, Jesus came to redeem you, to set you free from all the things that entrap you. Whatever that may be, that mess up your life. And he says, I want to set you free from all that stuff. I want to give you a new life, a new life with me, a new life of true and real freedom. Now, if I accept this better life, then I step up to the, from the good life to the better life. What do I do with my old life? You know, that old, exhausted, empty, enslaved life? Well, look what the Bible says you do. Romans 8 verse 13 says, For if you live according to your own human nature, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death your sinful actions you will live. So in other words, you don't hold on to your old life that had all, all that old stuff in there, all the sins and all the bitterness and worry and guilt and all that sort of stuff. Why on earth would you want to hold on to that old life? I mean, if someone gives you a new coat, an expensive new coat, and you've got a moth-eaten 20-year-old coat, you don't put that expensive one over the old coat, do you? You just throw away the old coat and put on a new coat. And Jesus says, look, the old life, the one that has no meaning or purpose, the life without me, just bury it. Let it go. Let it die. I'm giving you a brand new life. And by the way, Jesus gave us a wonderful symbol for this. It's called baptism. What they would do in the Bible is that they would go down into a river and they would dunk a person completely underwater and then bring them back up again. And now, why would they do that? Well, because it's a very dramatic picture. It's saying, I'm burying my old life, a life without meaning and purpose, a life without Christ, a life that was guilty and all the things, all the sins of that old life, I'm burying it and I'm now living a brand new life and I've been redeemed that Jesus Christ has paid for my punishment, has paid the cost, paid for my freedom. I'm now living a new life, a life with Christ. That's the picture of baptism. And if you've never been baptized, man, you are missing out on an experience and a half. And what a wonderful opportunity for you to declare you once, was a, your old life has gone, you're now new in Christ. Hey, Talk to me afterwards, fill a connect card in. We'd love to talk baptism with you. So this better life, real life, is filled with meaning. It's freed by grace. One final thing. Thirdly, it is a life full of energy. A life full of energy. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever get tired just thinking about all the stuff you have to do? Now, even before you do it, you feel exhausted, don't you? You think, oh, my goodness. Have you ever noticed that um, when you're, on you're a bit low on energy, 
Little problems become big problems. Have you noticed that? Don't nudge your husband or your wife if you're sitting next to them. Have you noticed that you don't have a whole lot of patience when your energy level is low? You know, the littlest things just annoy you? Or is that just me confessing my sins to you this morning? I don't know. Or have you noticed that there is this alarm, this warning alarm going off in your mind? You know there's something wrong, but you just don't know what to do about it. Let me tell you what it is. You're running on your own energy and your battery is about to run out. And the reason why is because you were never meant to live your life on your own power. It's no wonder you're tired all the time. God meant for you to be plugged into him and plugged into his power and not just go through life living on your own energy. So let me show you a couple of verses. Jeremiah 31, 25 says, those who feel tired and worn out will find new life and energy. And then look at uh, Zechariah 4, verse 6, it says, you will not succeed by your own strength or power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God wants you to plug into his power. Now, here's the good news. The same power that he demonstrated when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, when he came back to life to prove that he was God, that same power is available to you if you are a Christian on a day-by-day basis. Romans 8, 11 says, once the spirit lives within you, he will bring to your whole being new strength and vitality. God wants to give you a life full of energy. And if you're trying to live your life in your own strength and your own power, well, no wonder you feel tired all the time. No wonder you feel exhausted. God wants to give you a life of energy when you plug into him. Now, you have a choice here. You can go through the rest of your life living the good life, then disconnected from God's power, or you can live the better life plugged into God's power. It is your choice. Now, whichever one you choose, you will still have problems in life. Don't mishear me here. I'm not saying that when you become a Christian, as great and as wonderful as it is, that all your problems disappear and you live a problem, pain-free life. That's not the case. Sometimes problems get worse. Sometimes issues crop up. Sometimes it's... It is costly to be a Christian at times. Now, the difference is, is that with God in your life, with Christ in your life, you have the energy to cope with life, to live life as you should, and you don't have to rely on your own strength. Why? Well, because God gives you strength and power and energy day by day. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says this. Even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. That's great, isn't it? Now, I don't know, you may have come to church this morning just a little bit tired, feel worn out. Maybe you're on the edge a little bit. Wouldn't take much for us to just push you over maybe. Watch you suddenly explode around people. Maybe you feel like giving up a bit. Life is just difficult at the moment. Maybe you're in a relationship. It's not right. Maybe there are things in your life that are not right and you're trying to just push it to one side, but you know the reality is is that you're trying to live your life in your own strength and in your own way. And you're not finding that sense of real meaning and fulfillment. Maybe you're in a marriage and you're trying to make it work and it's not working. You feel like giving up on it. Maybe you're in a work situation and it's really difficult. Work colleagues are testing you. Work is hard. Maybe you, with your health, you just feel things aren't getting better. Maybe this is as best it's going to be and you're struggling with that. Or maybe you feel frustrated because you see doctors and one tells you one thing and one tells you something else. And you just don't feel like you're getting anywhere with your health. Maybe you feel like giving up on that child who's headed in the wrong direction, be it your own child, a grandchild, or someone that you know. Maybe you just feel like giving up on some of the dreams that you had or some of the things that you had in your heart. Maybe you just are feeling overwhelmed by life and you feel like giving up. Well, I would say to you, don't give up in this sense. Look up. Look up to God. Don't give up, but give in to Christ. In other words, stop trying to 
run your own life. Allow Christ to be at the centre. And say to him, Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to start living for you, not for me. It's not about me. It's not about what I want. It's not about my needs. It's not even about other people. It's about you and living for you. See, when you do that, he will give you that new energy, that new power, that new strength to do the things that he put you on this earth to do. No wonder when we're trying to do our own thing that we feel worn out and we feel like frustrated because actually these are the things that God doesn't want us to do. Why would he give us strength and power to do the things he doesn't want us to do? Why would he bless our lives if there are things in our lives that are wrong, are clearly sinful and clearly against what the Bible teaches, why would he, we expect him to bless our lives until we sort out those things that we know are wrong and clearly that go against what the Bible teaches? But when we seek to live for him and put Christ as number one in our lives, then he will give to you on a daily basis the energy that you need. Notice that on this verse, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Isn't that wonderful? That day by day, as we walk with him, there is this unfolding grace. Grace not only saves us, but sustains us and keeps us growing in him and in him. God says, look, the good life is not good enough. I can give you a better life, a better life with me. Now, you may say, hey, that sounds really good. How, How do I get that? How do I get this type of life? Well, again, you can't earn it. You accept it as a gift from God. You have faith and you believe and you receive what Jesus has done. It's in a relationship with Jesus that you get this better life. Now, you don't get it through religion. You don't get it by coming to church. Don't get me wrong. It's great to be in church. It's important to be around church on Sunday by Sunday, both morning and evening, in fact, to come and enjoy teaching and worship and fellowship and build each other up, to serve in church, to be part of church. But coming to church does not save you. No, you get it with a relationship with God. And it is a relationship. It's not knowing about God. It's not even hearing about God. It is knowing God through Christ. In fact, Jesus said this in John 10, verse 10. I came so that you can have real and eternal life, a better life than you ever dreamed of. That's why he came. Instead of feeling empty and enslaved and exhausted that the good life has, he says, I want to give you meaning and freedom and and energy and purpose. I wonder, will you step up for that better life, a life with Christ? Will you live for him? Now, if you're a Christian, that's my challenge to you this morning. Are you living for Jesus? Is he central? Is he number one? Are there things in your life that you know are clearly wrong and you've buried them? And you realise that actually, real life is when I live for him. And if you're not a Christian, you've heard maybe about Jesus many times. You've heard about God. You know about him. You know Christians as well. You, you, you know a lot. But actually, you're still living a good life. But you're not living real life. The better life that Jesus offers you. Will you today step across that line and say, do you know what? It's no longer about me. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now's the time I want to take that step. And if that's the case, then I want to encourage you to pray a prayer. It's a type of prayer that I prayed many, many years ago when I became a Christian, when I stepped across the line, and I said yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't have to pray this out loud. He knows your heart. He knows whether you're genuine or not. And there's nothing mystical or magical about the words that I'm going to pray on your behalf. Maybe this is the day you step across the line and say, do you know what, I want a real life. A life of meaning and purpose. A life with Jesus Christ. So let's pray together. And first of all, I'm going to pray for all of us. And then you can follow me in this prayer. And our Father, there are people here today who've never begun a relationship with you. They know about you. They believe in God, perhaps. They just haven't ever really known you. I pray that you would give them the courage to open their heart and their mind and their life to you right now. Maybe you might want to echo these words as I pray now. Lord, I want to start living the better life 
I realize that you made me for more than just the good life. So as much as I know how, I want to start living for you, not myself. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die for my sin. I don't understand it all, but I know enough to want to open up my life to you, Jesus Christ. And as best as I know how, I want to get to know you. And so I invite you to be my saviour, my Lord, to be in charge of my life from here on out. I want to exchange the good life for the better life, a life with Jesus Christ. And maybe those of us here are Christians, we've realised this morning, if we've been thinking and God's been speaking to us, maybe quietly, maybe loudly, tugging at our hearts, that actually we've not been living a life a life for Christ. That there is something or someone that has taken Christ's place at the centre of our life. And we realise that actually we need to repent of that, to make changes in our life and to put him back on the throne of our life, the centre of our life. And so we're going to do that, we're going to make that commitment Maybe some of us here, we've just been trying to live our own life, trying to do our own thing, trying to control our own lives, and we feel out of energy, we feel exhausted all the time, and we've just realised that actually we no longer need to try and be living for ourselves. Instead, we will live for you, for Jesus Christ. Whatever that might be, we will take steps to put Christ back at the centre. Father, we thank you that wherever we stand before you, you love us. Your grace is available to us. And Father, we would pray that you would help each one of us to take the next steps that you have placed upon our hearts this morning. And we thank you, Father God, that when we live a life with you, then we truly do have a life of fulfilment. We truly do have the better life because it is a life lived for you because we are created by God and for God. So we pray, Lord, that we might be people who take the steps that you've placed upon our hearts today. And in Jesus' name we ask it.